Welcome to this next session of uh, Creativity from Vienna to the World. Um, our topic today um, is designing new careers. Um, and we have two wonderful speakers with us today. Um, I will be starting by introducing the first one, who is Dr. Ladislav Jackson, um, an art and architectural historian. He's a faculty member of the Department of History and Theory of Art at Brno University of Technology. And he teaches global and local 20th century art history and critical theory, including gender and queer studies and critical race studies. He has authored and edited numerous books, uh, most lately Myth of an Architect, Jan Kotjera, uh, 150, uh, which was published in 2021 in, co in collaboration with Helena Chapkova. He has two forthcoming books, um, Philosopher of Structures, which is about the Czech-American architect and engineer Jaroslav Bulivka, and the book Images of Queer Desires, which is about queering art history and visual studies in the Czech lands. He also works as a curator, and recently curated exhibitions include Philosopher of Structures, which was shown in Brno and in Prague, and Shapes, of, uh, Shapes Colors, Comfort, Furniture, Chitona, um, shown in Hep, Sobieslav, and Ceske Budjevovice. And his paper today is titled Liane Zimbler from Viennese Sentimental Interior to California Mid Century Modernism. Ladislav, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, let me share the screen. I hope you can all see it. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank Julia and Megan for putting this wonderful, wonderful project together. It has been an absolute joy for me to participate both actively and uh, and in audience during uh, during previous events. Like most of the best things in life, research on Leonard Simbler came to me by accident. When Julia and Megan put out a call for papers for this project last fall, I thought it was a great idea, but rather a very specific topic and that I had nothing to contribute with on this subject. At the end of October, however, I visited the School of Architecture and Design at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg uh, in my role of the Vice Dean of International Relations at my school. My colleagues there prepared a very rich and interesting program for me, which included a visit to the International Archive of Women in Architecture, which I had never heard of before. However, there was a minor miscommunication uh, when arranging this visit, and the archive got the impression that I was from Vienna, and the wonderful archivist Jade Snelling prepared for me a sample of the Austrian women that they have in the collection. Among, among them were several drawings by Liane Zimbler. I was charmed by their beauty and wanted to know more about her. So immediately after returning to my hotel, I began to search for information about her. One of Zimbler's most published designs is the interior design of the hall in Robert Placek's villa in Brno, which rose my interest even more. <clears throat> Sorry. Liane Zimbler, born Juliana Fischer in Pserov to a Czech German Jewish family, graduated from the Kunstgewerbe Schule in Vienna where she received the status of an extraordinary student. As she recalled later, she was one, only one of two women among 40 men. Here she met Josef Hoffmann, Franz Cizek, Josef uh, Frank, and Oskar Sternat. It is not yet uh, exactly certain which teachers directly taught her and what classes, however, she met all of them. After the First World War, she established her own studio in Vienna, although she initially collaborated with the, with the, with the Wiener Werkstätte. Zimbler has recently received some research attention, especially from the Viennese design historian Sabine Forstgruber. A large piece of research was done by Christina Greve in her thesis on Zimbler, which was defended at the Technical University in Berlin in 2003. And chapters were devoted to Zimbler in their recent books by uh, Caroline Wol Wolgemuth and Ursula Prokop. Nevertheless, I could not find satisfactory information anywhere about Zimbler's work in Brno. So at this point, I started to dive down the rabbit hole and a new research interest 
uh, was born. When Simler's enormously prolific and rich body of work spanning nearly, nearly seven decades opened in front of me, I felt sorry that the architect who was in many ways ahead of her time was not given more attention to which I would like to contribute today. <clears throat> the commission for the interiors of the villa of a business, businessman Robert Placek in Brno from 1936 shows several of Zimbler's interests uh, and is at the same time the most extensive collection of her preserved drawings. In 1936, Robert and Teresa Placek rented a villa from Rudolf and Božena Trnka, which was designed for them by local architect four years before uh, Karel Hrabet in 1932. Placek came from a very prominent Brno Jewish family. Baruch Placek was a Brno rabbi and a scientist George Placek, who later worked on the Manhattan Project. The Placeks were also distant relatives of the Tugendhats, builders of Villa Tugendhat by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe in Brno. Thanks to earlier research uh, by my colleagues Dagmar Chernouškova and Lucia Waldhanzova, to, mo to whom I thank them very much for sharing their progress, I managed to locate the villa, which is actually quite close to the Tugendhat villa. Simbler designed the complete reconstruction and furnishing of the villa for the Placeks, who moved in in 1936 and lived there only for two and a half years. The winter garden, which also served as a summer dining room, contained two glass walls between which a microclimate was maintained for the cultivation of more demanding plants. However, it was not a whim of the clients, but one of the topics that Simbler devoted herself to for a long time in her proposals and theoretical writing. And in Brno, she got another opportunity to test it in practice. She published about the placement and care of plants and greenery in residential interiors, both in Austrian and late, both in Austria and later in the United States. Another theme that materialized in Simbler's project for Brno was designing a space specifically for women. The question arises whether Simbler was fulfilling the modernist idea that women are biological determined to a certain range of activities and to surround themselves with a certain range of objects or whether she thought about the topic more deeply. As I will try to show, it was the latter one is true. Simbler was aware of the inequalities that women faced and of the marginalization of women and she was also aware that these inequalities were manifested in how the domestic space was built and how it was organized over the centuries and it directed women to a certain position, determined their choices and controlled their activities, not mentioning that it objectified them. Uh, this was something that Simbler tried to change in order to help women in their emancipation, economic, cultural, and social. Simbler has devoted her entire life to change the situation of women's housing, solve the question what a woman needs in her space, how her space must be changed, uh, must change during different life stages, and how it should be as practical as possible so that she spends as little time as possible on unpaid housework, to which society condemns her. She knew that a woman needed a proverbial room of her own to have a space for her independent creative work, as Virginia Woolf aptly realized at the same time. Furthermore, Simbler asked herself the question of how such a room where a woman would have both physical and figurative space of her own should look like, how it should, be how it should function, how it should be organized, while it, was, while it will probably be quite small for most of women, at least at the beginning. In my today's talk, I will try to reconstruct in what ways we can talk about Simbler as a feminist. First of all, I want to deal with how she broke through glass ceilings and how she realized that the emancipation of an individual woman can only be achieved if as many women as possible are truly free. That is, if they find education, employment, and adequate salary. Therefore, I will try to illustrate her lifelong effort to raise and create opportunities for other women. Their organizing, uh, their organizing uh, was supposed to create an alternative uh, to male power pacts and uh, male power networks. Next, I will briefly comment on how Zimbler benefited from her involvement in women's organizing and how she contributed to it. 
And finally, I will try to formulate three ways to learn from Sindler in today's design practice, in which her forgotten work and legacy can be useful uh, to us today, 100 years after she began to realize her first orders, uh, her first commissions in Vienna. Art historian and writer Else Hoffmann became a key figure to Zimbler. Next to Max Eisler, an art historian with Czech roots, just like Zimbler, she was her main promoter in contemporary press, which mainly included Innen Dekoration, the Österreicherin, Österreichische Kunst. And in addition to Hoffmann, Eisler promoted her in Moderne Bauformen, which he led as an editor, and in Innen Dekoration as well. But for Zimbler, Hoffmann was far more than just an enlightened journalist who was willing to write about her. Hoffmann dealt with similar topics as Zimbler, oh, sorry, uh, the modernization of the world of women, which was supposed to lead to their emancipation. She did so through educational articles, but also practical manuals and fictional prose, fictional books. Plus, she became involved in Wiener Frauenkunst, same as Zimbler. She took some topics and knowledge from Zimbler. In some topics and conclusions, Zimbler learned from Hoffmann. Uh, this was the case, for example, with the subject of cottages, weekend housing, so-called second living, and what their economic and modern form should be. Zimbler subsequently devoted herself practically and theoretically to this for a consider considerable part of the rest of her life. In 1925, Zimbler founded a branch of her architectural office in Prague, which was led by architect Annie Herrenheiser. This was assumed by Zimbler's biographers without further investigation until, this until now. Herrenheiser came from a wealthy Jewish family that got rich from the legal distribution of cocaine, which was considered a legal medicine at the time from the United States. From the profits, they acquired a luxurious villa in a prominent district of Prague, Vinohrady. But as it turned out, the branch of Zimbler's uh, and Herrnheiser's business had a completely different beginning. It was a commission warehouse of the fashion branch of the Wiener Werkstätte, and Annie Herrnheiser was its administrator. And at this point, she didn't have any higher education. Zimbler rented an apartment in a strategic location opposite Prague's main railway station, where Herrnheiser started to live. Zimbler occasionally slept over, and the rest of the, of the apartment served as a warehouse where goods were transported by, directly, uh, by train directly from Vienna. However, Herrnheiser had bigger ambitions. At the age of 21, she entered into this joint business with Zimbler, but following her example, uh, and probably under her guidance, she began to study architecture. Probably at the German Technical, Un Technical University in Prague, there are no records of her studies at the Czech Technical University. At this point, their joint office apparently turned into a design firm, and they moved to an administrative palace uh, in the center of Prague. In 1930s, Herrnheiser participated in international architectural congresses and reported on them in the architectural journals. However, Zimbler kept the apartment near, near the railway station and Herrnheiser continued to live there. At the end of the 30s, Hedwig Rosenbaum, 40 years older than Herrnheiser, moved in with her. She was the first Czech professional tennis player. She, she won some, some, um, some um, tennis, uh, tennis matches in 1900 in Paris as well as other, uh, uh, and she was also um, another nonconformist emancipated woman widowed at the time. We have no information about the fate of Herrnheiser. A large part of her family was murdered during the Holocaust. Herrnheiser apparently managed to emigrate probably to New Zealand. Rosenbaum passed away shortly after the war began. Liane Zimbler emigrated just a couple of months after the Anschluss of Austria by Nazi Germany. She came with her husband, Otto Zimbler, and their then 16 years old daughter, Eva, to New York on a ship Paris uh, on September 4, 1938. Together with several friends from Vienna, she headed to Southern California, where she immediately began lecturing for various professional organizations. She was soon employed by Anita Thor, uh, only four years older than Zimbler. Thor was a well-known Los Angeles interior designer and a decorator 
who already had an established network of clientele. She became famous in 1936 after the opening of the California House and the Garden Exposition, which was a manifesto of the new eclecticism for the California suburbs. Eight exhibition houses with gardens and furnished interiors were presented here. California House, New Orleans House, Plywood House, which was designed by another Viennese expat, Richard Neutra, English Cottage, French House, Economy Cottage, and Colonel Evans Package House. Thor designed the interiors of English Cottage, but unfortunately she died prematurely in 1941. Simbler took over her firm. Simbler soon employed her daughter Eva, who became a partner in the firm. As Eva Simbler later recalled, she, quote, started her apprenticeship in her mother's office in Vienna at the age of five and learned to read blueprints before she was able to read, end quote. They began promoting themselves as a creative pair of mother and daughter. Sorry. Uh, they also built their branding around the generational gap. The young Eva Zimbler was supposed to represent a guarantee of modernity and progressiveness, while Liane Zimbler, in her 50s, was supposed to offer tradition, the connection of the new with the old, and conservative qualities. Although both creators were quite variable in style and simpler until her, until her old age, came up with various innovations, inventions, and experiments. For simpler, cooperation with female artists and decorators was essential. On the one hand, it was a way to ensure work, employment in architecture and commissions for her colleagues. And on the other hand, it catered to the Viennese taste of the bourgeois clientele. In Vienna between the wars, she enjoyed working with the artist and fashion designer, Maria strauss Lickarts. strauss Lickarts was able to provide her with paintings for furniture, walls, and painted wallpapers, glass, and so on. The ornamental register mainly included traditional floral motifs, imitations of folk art, and above all, oriental patterns. In this respect, Simbler was a product of her time. And in both Vienna and California, she satisfied her clientele's desires for exoticism, orientalism, and colonialism. She has never found a similar artistic harmony with the versatile artist after she relocated to California. Elsa Krumerk Crawford did several artworks and decorative works for a couple of Simbler's later interiors, mostly from 1970s. Uh, but she worked primarily with her husband, the architect Victor Green. Her work ranged from embroideries, textile paintings, ceramics, mosaics, decorative lamps, to metal applications, as you can see uh, in the Beverly Hills condominium. Um, Zimbler thus more often resorted to prefabricated decoration, extravagant wallpapers, often from the production of One Week Company, the Fine Arts Company, and other manufacturers. She collaborated several times with the painter Johannes Schiefer, who was four years younger than her, and, he, uh, uh, and in addition to the applied decorations, he imitated post-impressionism post in his paintings. Similar to Crawford, he also had a wide range of media and materials. Simler's effort to uplift other women and create creative and earning opportunities for them is one rather intuitive facet of Simler's feminism. But Simler soon began to organize herself. In 1926, she co-founded Wiener Frauenkunst, an organization bringing together women artists, designers, and architects. It was founded following the Deutsche Frauenkunst exhibition, which was organized by the Wiener Werkstätte in 1925 in Vienna's Kinstler House. Wiener Frauenkunst began to, organize, began to organize annual shows with perhaps the most significant, the third one, taking place in 1930 as part of the International Congress of Women and Professional Women. In, sorry, International Congress of Business and Professional Women. Art and craft created by women became a manifesto of emancipation, but at the same time, it was recognized as a legitimate profession in which women should have equal opportunities. Simbler did not want the art to be presented only as solitaires on the walls or on the plinths, 
but wanted to show how the works of art can be placed in the domestic living space. While at the same time, she wanted the exhibition to be a pleasant experience where there would be a place to relax, as you can see here. She devoted herself uh, to this uh, uh, in all the other exhibitions she participated in, followed by the Shen Evant exhibition in 1933, as you can see here. And again, you can see the uh, living corner or the relaxation corner designed by Zimbler here. She showed and promoted how to incorporate art into a modern interior, even in the United States, in addition to the annual exhibitions of the American Institute of, Institute of Decorators, in which she participated between the 50s and the 70s. We should mention her participation in the exhibition Living with Famous Paintings, which showed a combination of new interior elements, including plastic furniture, with works of old, modern, and contemporary masters. Simbler uh, picked a 17th century painting, as you can see uh, in the picture. Simbler even claimed, quote, Mort, like modern, is out, old is in, for young people, end quote, because she considered old art and antiques to be a suitable investment for young people, also because it is no longer subject to any fashion waves. Uh, fashion waves. She, uh, we change the appliances, we don't, do not change Rembrandt. Later, she even invented a system to adjust various pictures and antiques on the wall, which she named hook and loop, non-invasive and invisible hooks applied into the wall, so the aesthetics of the art and antiques is not spoiled. It was thanks to the Wiener Frau, Frauenkunst that Simbler became acquainted, uh, acquainted with current discussions and topics of contemporary feminism. Here she met, for example, Frankiska Plaminkova, one of the most original leaders of the Central European feminism of this time. Her most famous quotes uh, include, quote, men have created the entire society. The state system is masculine. The system of education is masculine. The family law and the organization of family is masculine. The organization of work environment is masculine. A woman has always entered into the male dominated, uh, male -dominated environments as a disturbing element, end quote. Simbler clearly, clearly understood the systemic problem of patriarchy, which can be explained by her later statement, quote, we have always been number two, so we have to try harder, end quote. Even when she wrote about the general topics and general problems of decoration and organization of a living space, she wrote from the woman's perspective. Organization was much more important to her than style or ornaments because it was about uh, the constant value of functional functionality. And the woman could thus avoid the following situation, quote, my house could be so beautiful, but my husband, the children and the dogs mess it up, end quote. What can we learn from Zimbler apart from the already mentioned? I will try to formulate uh, here mainly three of her inputs that she promoted already 90 years ago. And yet it seems that we cannot just get rid of the myth of endless production and acquiring new and new things or the idea of staying in one apartment throughout the entire life, even though it is not suitable and practical for most of the time. The essential benefit of Zimbler's residential interior is that we need a differently equipped and organized space for different life stages. Although architects in modern Vienna began to deal with the specifics of children's rooms, children's space, they were often mainly concerned with removing the children somewhere and displacing them so that they would not disturb the stylized, stylized interiors. Even when Josef Hoffmann uh, was designing a children's room, he designed it as a miniature of an adult interior, only considering surface finishing that would make it easier to wash. Zimbler, on the other hand, wanted to design children's rooms that would require as few changes as possible as children grow up and grow with them, a quality we only associate with the modular furniture designed after the Second World War. In Vienna, but also later in the United States, she came to design rooms for teenage women, where she placed particular emphasis on ensuring that the interior did not conflict with the changing tastes of teenage girls over time. Usually, she designed these rooms in such a way that the entire wall 
uh, was made up of a blackboard or a built-in board on which the, res the resident would be able to attach her own decorations and that the room had a day and night mode, ergo a living and a sleeping function. Simbler designed a large number of apartments and rooms for single women. Whether it was an apartment for the sculptor Lily Arona, oh, sorry, we're not there yet, uh, or unknown, other unknown women. She indulged them with everything that was available to men, including a stocked bar, a functional kitchen, king-sized bed, uh, plenty of storage space, and space for intellectual and creative work. Simbler also designed housing for a new bride, which was supposed to put together all the elements that a couple needs, such as a king-sized bed, a kitchen for daily cooking, and so on, in the smallest possible space that the young newlyweds can afford. In 1932, Simbler designed a mother's room with a nursery, uh, two alcoves, uh, where one was intended for the baby and one as a safe space for the mother to rest, to work, to read, and so on. The birth of, uh, the birth of children was also the motivation to modernize the bedroom in Vienna's apartment in 1934, which I will mention again in a minute. The woman lost a room of her own. It had been converted into a children's room uh, and she needed to spend more time in the bedroom during the day. All her life, uh, Zimbler also dedicated herself to the, to the modernization of kitchens, which were split primarily, uh, which were still primarily the domain of women, whether they were housewives or hired workers. She correctly perceived their design as the organization of a laboratory, which is what her younger colleague from the Kunstgewerbe Schule, Margaret Schitelihotsky, came to in the, in the design of the Frankfurt kitchen. Simbler found common kitchen furniture impractical, shapeless, monofunctional, and unvariable. She designed the kitchen in such a way that the movement in it is very organic, the work surfaces were of different heights, and the storage spaces were diversified. She also designed compact kitchens, which were closed in a built-in block, and when opened, the work surface and storage spaces became accessible. She promoted living kitchens, where dining is also done on a daily basis. She considered dining rooms to be an exceptional representative space. Later in the 60s, she frequently designed central kitchen islands or breakfast bars. In 1958, she approached a low uh, cost assignment to convert a double garage on the property of her daughter's Eva's, daughter Eva's house into economical housing of her husband's mother. Simbler was aware that the housing of senior women and especially widowed senior women is in some ways similar to the housing of single women, but at the same time, it must correspond to deteriorate, deteriorating mobility and overall health. So everything must be designed in such a way that it is accessible within reach without unnecessary barriers and so on. She rebuilt the double garage for a one room apartment with a kitchen, a patio, a terrace, and a bathroom core with a shower, which is more practical and safer than a bathtub for senior women. Simbler realized that the quality of housing for seniors and its accessibility affects their quality of life and an active approach to it. In 1972, she designed additional housing units for active seniors. Another phenomenon that Simbler promoted throughout her career was to contribute to the organization of the living space, the mobile interior. Built in folding beds, pull out work nooks, compact portable furniture and easy to move furniture should ensure that the function of the room changes at least twice in a 24 hour cycle. The rooms thus had day and night options. This was also applied uh, this also applied to the pull-out desk, here we go, uh, which does not need to be spread out all day, and when the woman is not sitting at it, uh, its place can be used in other ways, like here. Simbler also used these interior transformation strategies in the men's rooms, and later also designed various tools or portable mattresses so that the seating or relaxation zone, a relaxation area, could be moved around the house. 
changeable, sorry, I don't have a better picture of this, changeable mobile elements reach their peak in the conversion of a rustic house in San Bernardino, where Zimbler designed a gate in the wall between the kitchen and the larger dining room, uh, between which a heavy wooden table could be moved back and forth at will. When eating in the kitchen, there was free space in the dining room, and we when eating in the dining room, there was more space in the kitchen. The final lesson from Zimbler, to which I have dedicated a separate blog post on the Vienna to the World Project website, is recycling and upcycling. For economic, but also intuitively ecological issue, reasons, Zimbler advocated the use of existing furniture and existing materials during reconstructions. In the case of the remodeling of a bedroom in Vienna in 1934, which I mentioned previously, she used existing furniture and lighting fixtures from which she removed some finishes and out to date decorations and reused them in a new modern way and combinations. She has devoted herself to the promotion of recycling and upcycling several times on the pages of Perfect Home and Remodeling Guide magazines. In 1977, she designed the entire, entire recycled house in Beverly Hills, which was supposed to save material and money while providing completely contemporary and comfortable living. Leonard Simbler was a nonconformist woman, a designer, a feminist. She, was, she, she has a lot to offer today, unlike many of her male colleagues whether from the Viennese secession environment or representing California mid-century modernism, which was based on the myth of endless economic growth and the infinity of natural resources. And although her life trajectory was not always easy and she built her career from scratch at least twice, she was not afraid to stand up to her male colleagues and harshly criticize them when she felt like it. When she was asked, to comment on contemporary German architecture in 1962, she was not afraid to address the Romeo and Juliet minimal apartment project in Stuttgart from 1954 to 1959 as following, quote, the apartment house by Hans Sharon deserves the booby prize. It has messy layout, it's cramped, there, are no there is no storage space. The worst feature are the little penthouses on the top floor, end quote. I feel like most of all, we should learn from Zimbler's courage and we should uplift women like Zimbler and listen to them more. Thank you for your attention.